Uh, hello, my name is Mike Powell. I'm president of the Brunswick Civil War Roundtable. Uh, Ryan Gordon over at Parks and, Oak Island Parks and Recreation has asked me to do a few short videos on some local history uh, in the area. Uh, we've done a couple, and today we're going to talk about Smithville, which we now know as Southport in the Civil War. And if you give me one second here, I'll bring up my PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. Okay, Smithville was founded in 1792 and sits on the west bank of the Cape Fear River, several miles inside of Old Inlet, which is the stretch of water between Smith Island, which we call Bald Head, and Fort Caswell on Oak Island. 30 miles up the Cape Fear River is the city of Wilmington. In the Civil War, it was Wilmington, not Smithville, that was the prize. Wilmington had a railroad, a deep harbor for blockade runners to ply their trade, and it was also far enough from the sea that federal ships could not bombard it. Smithfield's Fort Johnson and Fort Caswell were the only forts at the mouth of the Cape Fear River before the war. The Confederates built forts and batteries over the next four years, all along with Cape Fear, and they formed the Cape Fear River defense system, all to defend Wilmington. Fort Johnston at Smithville was built in 1745 and was the oldest British fortification built in the Carolinas. It had been inactive for decades and it was designed to hold as many as 24 guns, but it never seems to have had more than nine. It was never considered a strong fort, uh, fortification. They hoped it was adequate though for its purpose of controlling river traffic. The war came early to Smithville, before North Carolina had even seceded or Fort Sumter fired upon, Colonel John Hedricks led a group of militia from Wilmington named the Cape Fear Minutemen. They left Wilmington early on the morning of January 10th in a small schooner, each man armed with his own weapon. On arrival at Smithville, they immediately took possession of Fort Johnston from the very surprised caretaker. And that would be Ordnance Sergeant James Riley. With a little more than a dozen men, he really had no choice but to surrender to their demands. Uh, it's interesting that Riley would go on to have an excellent career with the Confederate States Army and served as a major at Fort Fisher after uh, a distinguished career with Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. He was at all the big battles. With Fort Johnson secure, an intrepid group of 25 men under Captain Thruston of the Smithfield Guards sailed across the harbor to capture Fort Caswell from an equally surprised Sergeant Frederick Dardenkiller and his few caretakers. The fort was surrendered without incident. Governor Ellis, who was governor of North Carolina at the time, was a staunch Confederate to be sure, but he saw his responsibility to, responsibility to his office. And while North Carolina was still in the Union and the shooting had not begun, he saw his duty as returning the fort to federal property, however unpopular this may have been with the citizens. Governor Ellis, upon learning of the incidents on, on January the 11th, the next day, ordered Colonel John Cantwell, who commanded the 30th North Carolina Regiment of, North, of, of Militia, stationed at Wilmington. They were to, to proceed to the area and order the Wilmington Minutemen to return the forts to their federal caretakers. The governor's order stated, there is no authority of law under the existing circumstances for the occupation of United States forts situated in North Carolina. I cannot therefore sustain the action of Captain Thrust and however patriotic his motives may have been. Cantwell took a boat to Smithville and Fort Pender, now Fort Johnston, and Fort Caswell, which were returned to their caretakers on the morning of the 12th, however unwillingly. And uh, I have to correct, it would still have been called Fort Pender, in, um, I'm sorry, Fort Johnston in 1861. It would not change its name to 1863 to Fort Pender. 
Of course, there were differences of opinions about the prudence of the entire affair, whether to take the fort or not. It is this thoughtful, cautious attitude that brought North Carolina into the Confederacy last. North Carolina seceded on May 20th, 1861, and Governor Ellis died shortly after on July the 7th and is buried in Salisbury, North Carolina. There is interesting correspondence between Governor Ellis and President Buchanan, who was also leading, uh, who had Southern meetings. Uh, Ellis wrote to President Buchanan before Lincoln was inaugurated to inquire his intention as regards the fort. What were the Federals uh, going to do? The outcome of the correspondence is an arrangement that Ellis would not make any move on the fort if Buchanan assures him they will not be reinforced. The agreement held until two days after Fort Sumter was fired upon, and then Governor Ellis ordered Colonel Cantwell, quote, take Fort Caswell and Fort Johnston without delay and hold them until further orders against all others. Once again, Sergeant Riley was forced to surrender Fort Johnson and Smithville to the Confederates. Less surprise this time, I would imagine. This time, both locations would remain in Confederate hands until 1865. The inhabitants of Fort Caswell were sent over to Smithville. And for the next four years, Smithville's fate and history were tied to that of the forts at the inlets of the Cape Fear River. A local resident, Dr. Alexander Betts, echoed these sentiments of uncertainty and, un and misfortune. Quote, one of the saddest days of my life was in April 1861, when the news reached me at my parsonage home in Smithville that President Lincoln had called for state troops to bring back the seceding states to the Union. I loved the Union and prayed for its preservation, but now war could not be averted, it seemed. The drum and fife were soon heard in the village. Brunswick County formed Company G of the 10th Regiment North Carolina Volunteers. They and other units were assembling at Smithville, going off to war, camped and trained on the outskirts of town of Fort Johnston. Dr. Betts lamented that he knew them all and many were his parishioners. North Carolina seceded on May 20th. Lincoln's issuance of the Blockade Proclamation on April 19, 1861, changed Smithfield's role. The next day, the first blockading ship arrived off the mouth of the Cape Fear River. The blockade and the blockade runners soon dominated the activities at Wilmington, Smithville, and the Cape Fear River for the remainder of the war. <clears throat> Excuse me. Smithfield's proximity to the mouth of the river made it a perfect staging area, a place to wait in safety until the moon, the tide, and the position of the blockade runners gave, uh, the blockaders gave the blockade runners the best chance of gaining the open sea. Things were very civil in the summer of 1861. A correspondent for the Weekly Standard named Morell wrote, a pleasanter trip could not be taken than to go down to Smithville and over to Caswell. Saturdays, the boats are generally crowded for this purpose. We arrived at Smithville about noon, the steamer to remain here for two hours, giving us ample time for a stroll and a good dinner. The soldiers enjoy a happy life here, for it is one of the pleasantest places in summer in the entire country. However, the fall would not be as pleasant. At the end of September 1862, the steamer Kate ran the blockade and anchored at Smithville for three days before heading on up to Wilmington with her cargo loaded in Nassau. However, besides the war supplies, Kate had taken on yellow fever. The Fayetteville Observer reported, at Smithville, the disease took a stronger hold and we regret to learn that the number of deaths was much greater than we had supposed. As the fever raged in Wilmington, many of its citizens fled to Smithville, hoping to wait it out, only to find that the fever had arrived before them. Less than two months later, though, on November 19th, the Kate met her ultimate fate. The Charleston Daily Courier wrote, 
The steamer Kate struck the river obstructions near Fort Caswell early yesterday morning and soon after sank at Smithfield Wharf. Pilots have always been an important part of Cape Fear River history, and nearly 60 of them lived in Smithville when the war broke out. 27 blockade runners in the Cape Fear coastal waters highlight the importance of the blockade war. 27 blockade runners sunk in the Cape Fear. The pilots who guided the ships through the treacherous waters up and down the coasts and rivers played an extremely valuable service to both sides. The story of one of Smithfield's pilots stands out, John William Anderson. He was familiar with the entries of both inlets as well as the coastline. And in August of 1863, Anderson took the Mary Celeste out through New Inlet without any interference from the United States Navy. She reached Nassau in good time, but found yellow fever had struck the island. Anderson became ill even before they had, had left Nassau. His conditions worsened at sea, and by the time he reached the North Carolina coast off of New Inlet, he was dying. Without his expertise, they were spotted by a Union blockader. They were chased and fired upon, and it was a race to get over the bar at the inlet and into the safety of the Cape Fear River before the Federals sank her with gunfire. But without Anderson and the pilots' help, that was unlikely. Unable to walk on his own though, Anderson had several men carry him to the bridge and he was able to put them on the right course to enter the inlet and reach the calm waters, leaving the pursuers no choice but to break off before they became victim of the shoals. Anderson had used his last bit of life to get the ship to safety and within minutes he died. One of the most successful pilots from Wilmington was Thomas Mann Thompson. He was a blockade runner and a river pilot before the war. Most of what we know about him comes from a letter written by him to his daughter, Lily, in 1896. He recounts his career as a blockade runner. Made 34 trips, he said, and was fortunate enough never to have been captured. His greatest achievement, he thought, was in eluding 13 Union blockaders while he served in the CSS Atlanta within sight of New Inlet. He, he recounts other close calls being chased and fired upon and making it through rough weather. The passage of time has taken its, took its toll on his memory. He was writing some 30 years later, and it is a shame that his experiences were not recorded when fresher in his mind to recall the details of his exploits. <clears throat> All those successful trips left him a rather wealthy man after the war. When possible, he took gold instead of Confederate scrip. And this allowed him to purchase the property at 216 West Bay Street at a public auction two years after the war ended. Mary Elizabeth Mintz of Shalote were met. Uh, he married Mary Elizabeth Mintz of Shalote, and they had 14 children, nine of which reached adulthood. The house is under private ownership, but it was sold by the family in the 1960s. Originally, when it was built, it had 10 fireplaces and a separate kitchen on the second floor. In 1891, he made repairs and added a rear wing to the house that you can't see in this photo. It is the only house in, in Smithville or Southport now uh, that had a widow walk, and he lived in this house until his death in 1907 and is buried in the family plot in Old Smithville Burying Ground. There's another group of men from Smithville that served in the war but have received little acknowledgement or credit. They were the African American slaves and free men who left their owners and joined the US Navy. These contrabands, as they were called, used the Navy as a sort of maritime underground railway. In September of 1861, Gideon Wells, responding to the needs for men to fill the many ships that were used on the blockade duty, ordered the contraband's escaped slave to be enlisted in the United States Navy under the same rules and regulations as their white counterpart. 
The reports of correspondence of the Navy captains are filled with accounts of escaped slaves seeking their protection, rowing out to the blockade line in whatever they had. And with them, they brought valuable inf information, intelligence, black dispatches, they were called. They gave information on the forts of the area, the garrison numbers, what kind of guns they had, what kind of river obstructions were there, shipping schedules for the blockade runners, and what ships were being built. They also brought news of the yellow fever outbreak in Wilmington. These black dispatches figured in the planning of nearly every operation on the coast, in the Gulf, and on the Western rivers and was especially helpful in the 1864-1865 operations to capture Fort Fisher and the Wilmington. In 1863, Fort Holmes was built to further defend Old Inlet and added another link to the defensive system of the Cape Fear. The blockade runners of 1864 were more purpose-built ships than the converted steamers that were used in the war. 1863 ended with the report that there were nine guns of different caliber in an open battery at Smithville pointed in the direction of Fort Caswell to repel the Yankee army should they be able to capture Fort Caswell. 1863 outside of North Carolina was a turning point. Battles at Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, all brought about an ever shrinking Confederacy and ended Lee's string of victories in the East while gaining ground and valuable railroad and communication lines in the Mississippi River in the Western Theater. In January, now there, there were several plans by Union officers to actually capture Fort Caswell, but they were always rejected due to the need for troops elsewhere. In January of 1864, Major General Halleck wrote to Secretary of War Stanton, quote, the reduction of Fort Caswell alone will not secure to us the harbor of Smithville or close the, to the rebels and blockade runners access to Wilmington. At this point in the war, the Union were content to just strengthen the blockade around Wilmington. It was becoming one of the only ports available to the Confederacy. However, the war could not dampen the charms of the river town for everyone. In January of 1864, the famous poet Sidney Lanier visited Smithville and was much impressed with the town's civilities and the pleasant living. He said, with servants bearing white covered dishes of delicacies. Tradition tells us that Miss Kate Stewart and Sidney Lanier became very good friends during his stay in Smithville. It is said that he recited poetry and played his flute to Miss Kate while sitting in the moonlight on the banks of the Cape Fear River. The postcard you see shows pretty much the view that they had from the porch of Stewart House, which was one of the finer boarding houses on the East Coast owned by her family. Any look at Smithville's history would have to include Miss Kate Stewart. Born in 1844, so she was probably in her uh, about 20 years old when, uh, when she met uh, Sidney Lanier, lived in Smithville her whole life. Her family owned and operated the first class waterfront hotel. It was believed that Robert E. Lee and Woodrow Wilson both stayed there at one point and she became one of Smithville's most influential citizens. She was a patron of the arts, a teacher, a poet, a religious leader and host. James Price, a young resident of Smithville wrote, Never before nor since has the town of Smithville, although 100 years old, experienced such prosperity as came to it in the blockade running days. Successful pilots received between three and four thousand dollars for each round trip to the islands and back, and river pilots made three hundred dollars for a one-way trip to Wilmington. But however, the military was beginning to have an effect on the daily life of Smithville. Travel on the ferries to Wilmington and Fort Caswell were restricted, favoring military use. 
The battle fought by the Smithfield commissioners to keep a quarantine station away from their town failed on June 5, 1864, when General Whiting issued Special Order Number 165, stating that all vessels arriving by the Western Bar will be boarded at Smithfield. The quarantine grounds will be established near Smithfield and Drum Shoal. Surgeon Miller would have to certify the health of each ship and crew before they were allowed to proceed upriver. General W.H.C. Whiting took command of the Cape Fear region in 1863, but he was broken up. He was sent to Petersburg for a while before returning to command the 3rd Military District with his headquarters in Wilmington in 1864. Whiting was an engineer and spent most of his efforts in strengthening Fort Fisher at New England. He was a pain in Richmond's neck, frankly, and he continually bombarded them with demands for more troops, more guns, more everything. Of course, he was justified in his need for more of everything, but those actually fighting needed things too, and Whiting was not fighting yet on the Cape Fear River. One of the most interesting incidents of the entire Civil War in Smithville occurred on February 29th, 1864. One of the most daring raids was carried out by a member of the USS Monticello under Lieutenant William B. Cushing. Cushing was a fearless warrior who volunteered for every dangerous mission and usually was the one to propose the mission. On one or more occasions, he would slip through the blockade line, slip through the forts at the mouth of the river, into the river, past the forts to carry out a reconnaissance mission on the forts and river obstructions and Confederate defenses. He had several like-minded seamen to accompany him on his missions and he proved a thorn in the Confederate sides, but this was a capture mission. Governor Lewis, I'm sorry, General Lewis Hebert area commander was reported to be staying in Smithville. Cushing gives the details in his report. I passed the fort at the entrance to this harbor and two boats of 20 men on the night of the 29th then proceeded upriver to Smithville. My object was to land in that town, capture the commanding general, and board any vessels that might be found at anchor. I succeeded in landing directly in front of the hotel, hid my men under the bank capture some Negroes at work in the salt works and gained information as needed. He proceeded with three of his intrepid men, leaving the rest to guard the boats to a bear's headquarters, which was across the street from the barracks. The barracks probably had a thousand men in them, so he was taking great risk. I effected an entry and captured the chief engineer of these defenses, but found that the general had gone through Wilmington that day. Cushing's boats were only about 50 yards from the fort and he managed to return with his men and his capture. By the time the fort realized what had happened and sent up flares, Cushing's boats were already opposite Fort Caswell. They weren't even fired upon. Cushing had left a calling card for the general saying how much he missed his not being home when he called. Oddly, Cushing's brother, Alonzo, commanded the artillery battery at Gettysburg that took the brunt of Pickett's charge on July 3rd and was awarded the Medal of Honor after 10, about, about 10 years ago. As the action was heating up in the Cape Fear region, Whiting saw the Cushing raid as a warning of a larger invasion to come. He established a telegraph line from Lockwood Folly to Smithville in an attempt to increase the warning time his forces would have if the Federals came to invade. Signals were sent by lights from Fort Fisher to Price's Creek to Smithville to Fort Caswell over to Fort Holmes. Eighteen sixty-three, eighteen sixty-four. Wilmington were building two ironclads, the CSS Raleigh and the CSS North Carolina. They were both of the Richmond class and were both suffered from the inherent problems of all Confederate ironclads. They lacked properly rolled iron for their siding. They lacked engines with sufficient power. 
and they lacked proper armament. It was hoped that these blockade, uh, that these ironclads would be able to support the blockade runners entering and leaving the Cape Fear, but neither vessel was up to task. The Raleigh sortied on May 6, 1864, and was able to pass New Inlet and assist a blockade runner in reaching open water. However, as the Raleigh returned to the river, the next day she grounded on what was known as New Inlet Rip shifting the sandbag. It broke her back. Her decks collapsed as she was fatally wounded and abandoned. She remained a navigational hazard for years. The CSS North Carolina fared no better. Her officers realized that she would not be able to stand the strain of passing the bar and operating in the open sea. She was moored at Smithville as a guard ship only, a gun on a platform. Even this was too much for the forlorn vessel. And in September of 64, she sprung a leak and had to be abandoned near Battery Island, where she eventually sank, never seeing any action. In 1864, it was indeed the year of decision. Wilmington was now the only port left open to Confederate blockade runners, and the ever shrinking Confederacy was taking shape and closing in on the Cape Fear. Phil Sheridan cleared out the Shenandoah Valley. U.S. Grant held lead at Petersburg. Ben Butler tried to make motions against Richmond from Bermuda 100, and Sherman had taken Atlanta and was marching north to join Grant. In the center of all this is Wilmington. The campaign to shut the last door open to the Confederacy of Wilmington began in late December of 1864, Christmas Day. The Union attempt to capture Fort Fisher at New England. This was the key to the Cape Fear River. By capturing Fort Fisher, those defenses on Bald Head Island, Fort Caswell, and Johnston below New Inlet would be rendered useless. The Union could bypass them to reach Wilmington and the Confederacy was left with nothing to do but to evacuate those forts. The first attempt at Fort Fisher on December 25th was made by Ben Butler. Ben Butler was a political general. He was not a West Pointer. He was there because of his friends and his influence in Republican politics and Democrat politics, actually. But the Union forces landed on a beach under his command he did not think, as he approached Fort Fisher and could put his binoculars, he did not think that the naval barn barman had done enough damage to warrant an attack. He returned to his boats without attacking Fort Fisher at all. The next attempt, January 15, 1865, was made by professional soldier Alfred Terry in command. And after another sustained bombardment from the fleet, the Federals landed, again unopposed, and this time the attack captured the fort and most of its garrison with relatively little loss. The door to Wilmington was closed. Survivors who were able to get away made their way to Smithville. The next day, the forts at Old Inlet, Fort Caswell, Fort Holmes were abandoned and the garrisons made their way over to Smithville. But Fort Johnson was not the place for the Southerners to make another stand. Fort Pender, as it was called at this time, was not strong enough. So all of the survivors traveled north to Fort Anderson and the site of Old Brunswick Town to make their stand. The photo you see here is on the uh, USS Malvern. Uh, the gentleman on the very far left with the red arrow is Lieutenant Cushing. He was the officer that knew Smithville the best and was sent over to Fort Caswell on the 17th to accept their surrender. He found only an empty fort over which he raised an American flag. David Dixon Porter, the Rear Admiral commanding the U.S. Naval Forces off Cape Fear reported, Cushing then pushed on to Smithville and after hoisting a flag over Fort Caswell, Cushing continues the account with little more detail. I then proceeded with four men to Smithville and received this surrender from the mayor. 
and I hoisted our flag on the battery at that point. The inhabitants mostly remained in their homes and by their behavior impressed one with the idea that they had seen enough and were beaten back into loyalty. Cushing relates a story on the next night of the blockade runner Stag who came in through Old Inlet heading towards Smithville. But when he did not receive the correct signal from Fort Caswell, he became suspicious and was about to turn around and beat it. A quick thinking Ensign Huntington, who had found the Confederate signal book at Fort Caswell, hailed the blockade runner Stag and explained that the signal corps had been withdrawn, but it was perfectly safe for them to come on to Smithville, which they did. Imagine their surprise when they were boarded and captured by Lieutenant Cushing at the wharf at Smithville. The fake signal ruse was again successfully, was used again the next night to successfully capture the Charlotte. Lieutenant Cushing was not yet done with the <clears throat> Smithville though. Cushing gathered the slaves of Smithville on the garrison grounds at Fort Pender and formed a procession to parade the blacks to Moore Street where they marched down to Boundary Street to Nash Street and up Nash Street where they were dispersed, free to go where they pleased. This was Cushing's last action at Smithville, but his daring exploits would continue in the battle for Fort Anderson. So Smithville now becomes a depot for supplies that the Union Army would use in their pursuit of the Confederates to Fort Anderson and eventually to Wilmington. Admiral Porter wrote, I want all supplies in Fort Caswell brought to Smithville, locked up and kept for the use of the troops when they arrived there. You will permit no one to go out of town or straggle. Allow no outrages to be committed or property of the inhabitants to be interfered with. Punish anyone severely who resists these orders. He also ordered that Smithville be established as a repair station for his ships. His orders pretty much went unheeded and sailors had broken into the court, the courthouse, threw around all the papers, some of which dated back to the American Revolution. They actually went into the Masonic Lodge and stole the Masonic jewels, which would be eventually returned by a surgeon on the Monticello who was a Mason. Order would not be restored until the end of, of the month when Colonel Barney and the 149th New York Regiment arrived to take control. Union forces under Jacob Cox left Smithville on February 17th in pursuit of the thousand or so fleeing rebels toward Fort Anderson. As it turned out, Fort Anderson may have been the right site for the final stand by the Confederacy, but the number of men they had to defend the sprawling fort was nowhere near the number needed and the retreat continued without hardly engaging the advancing Federals. Wilmington, which the Federals captured a few days later, sounded the death knell for Lee's army in Virginia. Without supplies from Wilmington, Lee was forced to surrender within weeks. So for Smithville, the war was over. But it would be the scene of many reunions held by Confederate veterans of Brunswick County it consisted of speeches, election of officers, more speeches, a dance, a dinner, and of course, the great interaction between the old soldiers. They were generally held in conjunction with Memorial Day celebrations, and Miss Kate Stewart was generally the one to make it all happen as president of the Monument Association. Smithville would have to struggle to rebuild their economy and deal with the reconstruction issues, just as did the entire South for the next 12 years. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this little look at Smithville during the, uh, during the Civil War. You can get more information from the North Carolina Maritime Museum, Fort Johnston Visitor Center, and a great place to spend some time just thumbing through documents is the Susie Carson Research Center online research provided by the South Port Historical Society. So stay safe and hopefully we will be able to get back to our regular meetings soon. Thank you.